So Ling Ling, let me turn it over to you for an overview, the view from Beijing. Uh, what kind of mood do you think Xi Jinping is in right now? Uh, and uh, how do you see this playing out, both for the next 10 weeks, as you pointed out, Trump administration is not over, um, and also going forward? Sure. Uh, first of all, I should say thank you very much for having me on here. It's such a pleasure uh, to basically uh, share this panel with uh, Mary and Ted. Um, what's the mood in Beijing these days? Um, you know, uh, one thing that's really interesting is that um, in the past, uh, during the past uh, U.S. elections, uh, the Chinese leadership, just probably like, you know, the rest of the world, they would make their own projections, right? Back in 2016, uh, Beijing's bet was on Hillary Clinton, and their diplomats in Washington made early outreach attempts to the Hillary, uh, Clinton campaign. Not this time around. They didn't make any projection within Zhongnanhai at all because to the Chinese leadership, whoever in the White House in the next five years or four, or four years really doesn't change uh, the fundamental nature of the relationship anymore. Uh, for China, the past two years of trade war has made the leadership conclude that the US is no longer a reliable partner. Um, so, you know, what they're doing, they're pursuing a, a policy agenda that aims at really um, protecting China, China's interest uh, from growing pressure from the US and other uh, Western democracies. You know, this whole uh, dual circulation policy slogan is re really more about internal circulation, which means prioritizing domestic markets, domestic uh, companies, and domestic um, industries, um, you know, uh, 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 just in, uh, uh, make sure that, you know, in Xi Jinping's own words um, is, you know, match our own affairs where, well. So, so there have much inward turning focus these days. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, at least in some corners of the Chinese government, there is, uh, you know, after uh, Mr. Uh, Joe Biden uh, won the election, or at least declared that he won the election, there was a sense of relief in many corners of Chinese government. Uh, the whole trade war and uh, the uh, cascade of actions, sanctions against China over the past few months really got many Chinese officials really exhausted. Um, they're probably also like the rest of us here and journalists and economists alike, uh, kind of hoping for a break, right? Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's you know, in, in some ways it's wishful thinking as Mary and Ted just laid out very clearly, um, the Biden administration not going to uh, soften its approach toward China uh, probably in any way. Uh, if anything, he, as, China, uh, as Mary put it, he's the alliance man, right? He's, he's gonna be more strategic, potentially also more patient. Unlike Trump, he wanted to completely change China in a year, right? L uh, good luck there. Um, so, so, you know, um, we we're just uh, joking with a friend back in Beijing, maybe two years from now, China will miss Trump in some way. Um, so, um, you know, Obviously, there's a realization in Beijing that um, it's very hard to go back to where um, the relationship was, you know, before Trump came to power. Um, and, you know, China's own policy, this domestic focused inward turning policy also means China is increasingly on divergent paths from that of the US. So the confrontation, you know, the further confrontation is really inevitable and faced with a more potentially more strategic by demonstration that um, uh, might renew its uh, focus on building allies and, and work with allies who confront China, you know, China is being very proactive now. You know, uh, both uh, Ted and Mary talked about RCEP, this regional agreement, right? Uh, and, and Xi Jinping recently also talked about, you know, cutting trade deals with Europe. Uh, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, of, of course, it's either set them down because the uh, BIT, potential BIT with Europe would uh, require a lot of more concessions from China than RCEP. You know, RCEP, um, you know, in some ways is a limited 
uh, trade agreement. It doesn't really cover a lot of the thorny issues we um, we know that exist, like uh, industrial policy, state-owned enterprise subsidies, and all that. But still, it's a huge win for China. Right now, you know, China actually can enjoy very low tariffs uh, with countries like Japan and South Korea and Australia, right? So this is something they didn't have before. Uh, it's, it's a huge, um, uh, I mean, at, at least based on what I know, people in Beijing very happy about it. Um, they're, they're going to obviously um, uh, step up their effort in, their, uh, in, in, uh, in that regard. But when it comes to uh, the US-China relationship per se, you know, uh, one thing, you know, internally with my colleagues and my, you know, friends, I always, you know, there's this one question I always thought about is generations of Chinese leaders, um, they have always been judged by how they handle the relationship between the, uh, China and the U.S. Mao Zedong, for all the mistakes he's made, he's credit for building this formal ties with Washington. Deng Xiaoping further advanced it and Hu Jintao and Jiang, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao both you know, deepened it further. Xi Jinping doesn't want to be the one who would be blamed for losing America. Uh, so that, you know, that really, uh, because, mm. because he, some, you know, for him, the top priority in the next two years and a half is a smooth ride into his third term without any challenge, both inside and outside the party. He's, he, he wants, you know, he's, he, he's basically one hold on power, much very secure. But this potential problems in US-China relationship really uh, are emerging as one of the biggest threat to that, you know, smooth right he is desiring. So he's not going to be uh, too uh, aggressive and provocative in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to just, you know, uh, destroy the relationship completely. However, he's also built up this image as a very strong leader, right? Most forceful, powerful, ideologically driven Chinese leader in recent history. He cannot back down either. So he's kind of also in a dilemma. Um, uh, you know, uh, both Ted and Mary talked about what the Biden administration can do, right? To improve its ties with allies, with China. Uh, the same question is for the Chinese side as well. What China can do to improve ties with the US if indeed they don't want to destroy the relationship completely? And would they offer any kind of new voice? Would they offer any kind of new approach to this US-China relationship. That's something I think all of us uh, will be on the lookout for. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe just pause there. Well, Lingling, Ling, thanks for that marvelous overview and uh, the great observation about uh, Xi Jinping doesn't want to be the, the guy who lost, China, who lost America. Um, can I bring you back to a question um, uh, that we've touched on a lot in the last um, 10 programs, but never really addressed uh, f completely, that I think will be a problem for uh, any administration next up and for Xi Jinping. What do you think China will do about the uh, issue of international property theft? This is not a partisan issue. There's rising ire, I think, across the uh, spectrum in the United States, certainly in Congress. There's you know, lots of Democrats who are extremely exercised um, about the issue, who feel that, um, that it hasn't been censored, that the Trump administration made a number of you know, attempts um, to, to censor, to whack them, to punish them, to retaliate, um, but really hasn't cracked the the underlying issue. Um, do you, and this is something that I think, um, you know, will continue to be a wedge. What do you, uh, what is your sense of how Xi Jinping sees that issue um, and whether he would be able to without publicly, as you say, losing face or conceding or um, losing his mantle of the you know, great Chinese leader, can he do anything about this? Does he want to? And could he? And would that be an olive branch that he could reach over to Biden, or is it not in his interest to do that? Because, as you say, he's pursuing a Chinese nationalist, you know, domestic industry first policy. Sure, um, that's a great question. I do believe the Chinese government, um, you know, uh, including the very top leader, has every intention to address the IP 
protection issue. I mean, it's not just about protecting foreign companies, it's also about protecting China's own companies. There's so many private businesses in China, you know, complaining to the government, oh, the uh, SOE02 just uh, stole my IP. You know, uh, it's, it's really as much a domestic issue as it is an international issue. They have every intention to do it. However, what Xi Jinping doesn't want is to be seen as somehow being pressured to um, uh, to take steps to address the IP protection issue, especially pressured by the U.S. Um, they have to uh, move, uh, you know, based on their own pace and 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 you know make sure that people uh, understand it is in China's interest to address the issue. Is China is doing this voluntarily without pressure from the U.S. And this is something that's very different from you know 20 years ago, right? Back then, foreign pressure was really good for reform for market changes in China. Not anymore. Because in Xi Jinping's view, China has already risen, it's, you know, at least economically, China should be treated as an equal at, uh, you know, to the Americans. So the days of China being bossed around basically over. So they want to do things that's good for the China's economy. They don't want to do things that make it look like, you know, China is being pressured to do that. I think, I think that, um, you know, uh, one, that's one thing um, the Trump administration really, one area of Trump administration seemed to have made mistakes because I just find it amazing. They don't, they, they seem not capable of thinking what it takes for the other side to cut a deal with you. They all, they, they just think about what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want to accomplish. But how about the political constraints in your you know, a, a opponent's country? So I, I think you know, for, for really you know, good deal maker or politician you know, many years uh, down the road, that's something really needs to be considered. You know, what needs to really, uh, if you, you know, China really is not enemy. If if you um, because all the U.S. companies you just um, you talked about that earlier, especially tech, the supply chains, and all that, all the U.S. companies, most of them still want to be in China, even though now they're probably not expanding because the geopolitical uncertainty. So, with all that interest remaining there, so you know, this is really uh, really falls upon the government to figure out approach to make sure the re relationship still functional functioning not like you know right now it's just like no talk no dialogue all you see it's just basically you know sanctions uh, upon sanctions you know just for the sake of being tough on china mm -hmm.